Good afternoon, everyone. This is Robert May, Executive Director of the Kensington at Redondo Beach, coming to you live with a very exciting afternoon of culinary experiences. I am so proud to present the Kensington Redondo Beach and the Kensington Sierra Madre with our two marvelous chefs the, who will be showcasing some amazing dishes today with uh, Dean and Aisha Sherzai. And we are gonna be featuring their new cookbook, recipes from that new cookbook called The 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution. And in that book, you will find important recipes, easy to make recipes you can share with your family. Um, and especially with the season coming up, the fall season, um, these are recipes that are easily done and can be done together with family members. Um, so you can also have the wonderful experience of cooking together. And uh, so it's gonna be a, a great event. I hope that you all will um, participate. We have questions at the end that you can ask. So please do not be shy, come forward with questions. One of the things I'd like to say is there, this, this seminar reminded me of a, of a quote. Um, that uh, one cannot think well, love well, and sleep well if one has not uh, dined well. And that's from Virginia Woolf, and I think it's true. The importance of dining in our lives um, is something that has been realized as a result of COVID. One of the uh, side effects of COVID is that I think that we've been uh, able to share a greater intimacy in our dining experiences with our family and our friends. In addition to that, now that we're perhaps getting through a lot of these the, the COVID um, pressures, we now can also experience and, and begin to dine um, at restaurants. And that allows us to also continue some of those wonderful practices that we had before. But it is about dining with family, cooking with family, sitting down and sharing meals. Here at the Kensington, the dining experience is of paramount importance to us and our residents. We are very empowered by this new cookbook, the 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution. We utilize recipes from this cookbook and share that with our residents. And uh, some of those um, recipes we will share with you today. So I would like to introduce to you Aisha and Dean Sherzai, who are here, they are actually our neighbors at Redondo Beach. They are right around the corner, but I would like to introduce both of you. Welcome to the Kensington Redondo Beach and Kensington Sarah Madre cook-off. Hi, Robert. Can you see and hear us? I can sure see both of you. Amazing. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be here with you and with the wonderful audience. Thank you so much for having us. You're very welcome. So I, I guess uh, this is um, the inaugural event. We we love being uh, neighbors and working with uh, Kensington, the greater national Kensington. I think our, our uh, visions are so similar and, and at the core, it's about trying to help people um, and uh, you know, reach communities where they need the help, and that's what we are here for. Absolutely. Um, you know, we are both neurologists, uh, but at, at, in our our core uh, mission and our desire is is essentially public health and disseminating true and tangible, uh, meaningful uh, actions that would help us live a healthy life, especially a brain healthy life, an unforgettable life, if I may say so. And, you know, um, like you said, uh, Robert, dining and eating and connecting with other individuals is one of the biggest parts of living a brain healthy life. You know, for the past uh, almost 20 years now, our research has focused on the importance of a healthy lifestyle for brain health and for longevity. And to that end, we wrote two books, The Alzheimer's Solution and The 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution. Um, our literature research has been focused on empowering individuals in the community to take care of themselves, of their brain health and um, you know, really fulfill the capacity of their brain and uh, live a wonderful life. Thank you. Yes, uh, you know we're we're big fans of of both those books, and and those books are really you know have made a qualitative difference in terms of 
the the um, the approaches to to healthy living, and it comes back to food again. So much of it is, you know, returns to food and 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 how that is part of our lives and how important it is and how the brain adapts to good food, how the brain is able to adapt to good food within a very short period of time. It doesn't take months and months and years, but that's why I'd like the title of your book, The 30-Day Approach, that it allows you to get right in there and change your habits and get away from that soporific effect of meals that you mentioned in your book where you know we eat these heavy meals, we get so tired that we really can't function after them. That's, you know, you, you, you talk about that. That's not what, you know, the, 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 um, the solutions that, that you're providing for us today are about healthy choices. I mean, there's a reason that you feel that what they call the food coma. You talked about the soporific effect that the food coma is not a normal thing. You shouldn't feel that. You can feel, you can actually eat quite a bit of food. Mm -hmm. It's not the quantity, actually, it's the type. You can eat a lot of food and yet not only not feel sleepy and you know the, the the and and tired and fatigued, but feel more energized. That concept itself should tell you everything about food. The the the, the meals that you take in three to four times a day is more important than any medicine that you could ever take now or forever. I mean, we're not against medicine. We're doctors. No. We give medicine, yeah. but the meals are your ultimate medicine. Um, they can either make your brain or break your brain. So that's why, um, I mean, Aisha, I'm going to give a little bit of advertisement to my wife, <laughs> act like I don't know her, but let's just say. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when she was in Columbia University doing her fellowship at, at night in the morning, she would be in the ICU and at night in culinary school learning, because when you have these patients that have had these traumatic, you know, events like strokes and dementias and vascular, uh, we know that the only long-term answer is teaching people how to make healthy, tasty, easy food yeah. that will heal them. So that is at the core, of course, the brain health revolution, I take it. That's right. Yes, it is. Um, the concept that, you know, every small incremental changes in your food and in your lifestyle can make tremendous changes to your brain health. And, and the, the brain health revolution is a community. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the goal of the community is to be in, a, in, a, in an environment where you constantly are getting positive feedback, appropriate and accurate information, because there's a lot of information out there. And some of them actually ostensibly on the surface look so good, but they're actually damaging. They're so nice. accurate, they're noise. Yeah, they're science-based information accurate and, and and achievable information meaning that they can give you these bombastic you know unusual things like you get this seed from an island off the shores of you know some uh, uh, philippines that you have no access to that real everyday life that can rebuild your life so that's the whole point of brain or brain health revolution to create the environment to create the community to create the resources and and research has shown the thing that helps the people make the behavior change easiest and more effectively is when you have a empowered community with you. Yeah. Interesting. And also access to, you know, foodstuffs that are around us that we can utilize. And I think what we're going to show showcase today are foodstuffs that are easily available to all and allow them to cook really magnificent, splendiferous meals that are actually can be really fancy. But, but yet simple and delicious. And that, that's kind of the secret of it all, right? It's Sometimes it's not about how fancy things are. It's not about the silver fork or the silver spoon. It's about all these wonderful ingredients that are already around us that we just have to reappreciate, rethink about, and utilize in a different way. Beautifully stated, Robert. I couldn't have said it better. Well, how about we go and, and begin the first food... Um, demonstration with our chef, Erwin Torres, who is a director of uh, dining services here at the Kensington Redonda Beach. And you're going live uh, with Chef um, Torres, and you are creating a, an amazing dish called the Sweet and Spicy Braised Butternut Squash. Yes. So um, 
to all who are watching, we're going to showcase this wonderful recipe. It's and uh, it'll it'll show you the entire process of making this great dish for the for the upcoming fall. Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. My name is Dr. Aisha Sherzai and I have the pleasure of having Chef Erwin from Kensington Redondo with us at our home and we're going to cook together. Welcome Chef Erwin. Thank you. Are Thank you, you excited to be here? Yes, I am. <laughs> of course you are. We're really happy to be cooking together because uh, you know, for the past few months we've been talking about implementing healthy foods for brain health and we wanted to focus today on making a plant-centered dish. You know, a lot of times vegetables are always on the side or they're not really highlighted very well, but we wanted to come up with an amazing dish for you to show you how beautiful it is to showcase vegetables. And mm. the star vegetable today is the butternut, butternut squash. squash. So butternut squash, that's my favorite. Do you like butternut squash? I love it. So this dish is actually my mom's recipe. And when we were growing up, she would really make beautiful uh, dishes centered on vegetables. And I love butternut squash. Well, first of all, because it's November. And second, it just is so versatile. You can make a puree out of it. You can bake it. You can braise it. But today we're going to focus on making a braised sweet and spicy butternut squash with a beautiful garlic herb uh, yogurt dressing on top of it. Sounds great. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, Chef Erwin is going to process the butternut squash for us. And uh, we're going to use about, you know, um, two pounds of butternut squash. This was like roughly close to four, mm -hmm. but without the skin and without, you know, the seeds and everything, I think it is going to be um, about two pounds. So Chef, you're going to skin it. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks beautiful already. Yeah, it does. I think I bought like, a lifetime supply of butternut squash yesterday from Trader Joe's because it was on sale and um, sometimes you know the inside of it is fibrous mm -hmm. but this one actually looks really nice yeah it has two different colors it has two different colors absolutely so this is gonna look very very nice and we're going to slice it into half moon shapes and we're going to bake it oh by the way before you even start processing the butternut squash um, turn on the oven to 400 degrees and I just did that because you want it to be nice and warm before you place the butternut squash there so chef do you eat butternut squash yes I do I'm a sweet person so I prefer to cook squash as a dessert like for pies or we also have at home um, made uh, recipe uh, which is uh, made with acorn squash another type of squash that's amazing what do you do with the acorn squash uh, we bake it we dehydrate it with um, um, brown sugar and uh, uh, star anise cloves and it's really good oh my gosh just the sound of those spices together with the sweetness um, and you know sometimes when you enhance the sweetness of a food or a vegetable mm -hmm. it actually even gets better um, so you know sweet sweet squash is very very delicious wonderful we actually are going to add some sweetness to this dish as well when we're making the braising sauce we're actually going to add some brown sugar but to keep it like sugar free and healthy I actually got some monk fruit sweetener which is you know it's like a, um, a golden monk fruit sweetener it's um, not advertising it in any way, but it's a really good sugar replacement. It doesn't have, you know, the uh, the glycemic effect of regular sugar, but it really is, it tastes the same and it's just wonderful. Oh, this looks really good, Chef. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we've got our beautiful squash going here. And now what we're gonna do is basically just put it in a dish like that. And we're going to, uh, you know, add some olive oil there. I never like, I don't know, Chef, how you do it, but so we're getting this ready to be baked in a baking dish, but I don't like putting oil on the baking sheet because you just waste everything. Yeah. So yeah. Next to here will be better. Exactly. So um, I do have some extra virgin olive oil that I'm going to drizzle on top, and you could just kind of toss it, chef, whatever is easy for you. And we're going to minimize the salt in this dish because you know it's much better to kind of reduce salt. Salt has been associated with high blood pressure and so many other things. So maybe you can actually just place it right here. That looks beautiful, Chef. Excellent. And you know, um, using a parchment paper is a, an excellent idea 
because it won't let it stick. But if you have, although it's kind of rare to have non-stick baking sheet. You know, I, I love using parchment paper because it's just easy to toss your baked vegetables. All right, so our oven has been on for a few minutes now at 400 degrees. And we're basically going to bake this. Look how beautiful this looks already. Look at the color. And we're going to let it roast for 15 minutes on one side. And then we're going to flip it and just roast it for another 10 minutes or so to let it Great. soften up. Okay, so our butternut squash is baking beautifully in the oven. And Chef Irwin and I are going to make the braising sauce for it. Now this is a really easy one and you basically need things that are in your pantry like onion, garlic, ginger, and I have some spices, turmeric, I have some dried coriander that we're going to add and maybe a kick of chili. Do you like chili? Oh, Chef I love Irwin? chili. I, I, like, I like a little Spicy. sting. Right? I like a little thing, but for people who can't really tolerate spice, I think it should be fine if they want to completely avoid it. My mom used to put like real green chilies, you know, mixed with the whole gravy, but we're gonna take a little easy today. So now Chef Erwin is uh, mincing our garlic and we have a little bit of ginger going on and it already smells really wonderful. So the next thing we're going to do is um, go ahead and focus on the braising sauce. So we have a hot pan going and I'm just going to turn it on at medium high. Initially it's going to be at medium high and then we're going to lower the heat a little bit to let it cook and simmer very nicely. And in a nice pan, and you can actually use a braising pan or a Dutch oven even, but something that is deep enough to hold all the butternut squash in here. I'm just going to spray it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. So chef, I try to minimize oil as much as possible. Okay. I know that it's, you know, it's important for browning and for flavor. Extra virgin olive oil is amazing, um, you know, compared to all the other oils. It has a lot of mono and polyunsaturated fats, so there it is. And then I have a finely diced onion. This was like one of those like ginormous Costco size onions. Um, and we're just going to add the onions in there. And then um, chef is going to add about two cloves of garlic. Now we're just going to saute it nicely and let it cook. We're, we're going to add the ginger a little later because ginger kind of, if it's cooked too much, it might actually impart some bitterness. Uh, maybe a little bit more, Chef. What do you think? You know, I, I love the warming taste of uh, ginger, ginger in food. All right, so this is going to basically slowly and gradually caramelize and we're going to be gentle with it. Make sure that it's spread and just don't bug it too much and let it cook. Make sure that the heat is not too high because if the onions burn, then it becomes really bitter and you have to yeah. like start all over again. Chef, do you like caramelized onions? Yes, I love it. I think, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, whether it's vegetables or grains, um, in French cooking, you know, there's the a trilogy of adding onion, uh, celery, and carrots along with garlic, mm -hmm. and in a lot of other cuisines too. I don't know how it is in, in uh, South American cuisines, but in Indian cuisine and in Mediterranean cuisines, they always caramelize onion at the base, and then you, when you add things to it, it just gives it an amazing flavor. Right, right. Amazing. Okay, so we're just going to let it caramelize, and it's okay if you want to add a little bit of water if it becomes too dry. One of the ways of, you know, one of the good ways of minimizing oil in food, which is not necessary for everyone, but some people may want to, is just a touch of oil or maybe, I'm sorry, water or maybe a little bit of broth to kind of let it just cook in its juices and it looks really good. Okay, as you can see, Chef, it's kind of getting nice and translucent, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, it, it? It was a little dry, so we thought we should actually add a little bit of oil in it, but I also don't mind especially when it's cooked, adding a little bit of water, water. to kind of deglaze the pan and make sure that all the flavors all the flavors mix absolutely. Okay, chef, do you want to add the ginger now? Yes. All right. So we have about a, you know, like a half a teaspoon of ginger 
and um, chef was kind and he um, basically microplaned it so we took the ginger and we microplaned it from here but you know sometimes if people can't do it or if it's just too much it's always a good idea to uh, you know use uh, some frozen ginger or the ones that come in jar um, Trader Joe has these small little packets of mm -hmm. ginger frozen and they come in tiny little cubes and you can just add it to your to your food and obviously things fresh. like ginger fresh is always the best you think so? yes thank you so what do you think uh, chef um, just to make things easy at home so that I'm not like always in the kitchen mm -hmm. I do a lot of prep work and what I do is I buy a large amount of garlic and a large amount of uh, ginger I process it in a food processor and then I freeze it I get one of those like little ice cubes mm -hmm. and I just kind of compact the, the, the garlic yeah what do you think? Do you think uh, it loses its flavor when you do that? Uh, it does, um, and also we not recommend to add any uh, olive oil in it because it also changes the, the flavor of the garlic. So Absolutely. So what I do at home, I, I, I even if, the, if it takes extra time, I really chop it per 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 meal or per, yeah. per, per order. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it it does really make a huge difference when it's fresh, doesn't it? All right. Okay, then forget about what I said. <laughs> Don't buy, or maybe if you want to do it quickly for a quick meal, that's fine, but try to use as, as much as you can fresh. Yeah, and there's some really nice garlic pressers. And, yes, you know? sometimes I just press it with my, my knife, something like this, yeah. and then start chopping it so all the juices comes out. Yeah, yeah. No, I love smashing garlic too. It's good when you're out, you've had a bad day and you just come home and you smash garlics and get <laughs> no, your frustration out. Okay. Anti-stressful technique. Cooking is anti-stressful. Correct. Yes. Do, it do is. you feel that way? Yeah, I feel it. Even if I, I'm I'm cooking all day, I still cooking at home. Sometimes my wife does, but um, it's kind of you know it, it's a passion passion. So even if I'm I feel tired when I'm cooking, I forget about. It. If I have sore legs or or even if I had a bad day, I forget everything when I'm. Amazing. Cooking. So cooking is not only good because you have control over what goes in your food and in your body and for your brain, it's also a good de-stressing technique. Yes. It really is one of the most beautiful arts because you're seeing, you're tasting, you're smelling, and you're involved in creating this beautiful dish. You know, for people who don't have en enough time to cook, I always say, just make one dish a week. Just find some time to mm -hmm. immerse yourself into a dish and really enjoy it. And especially if it's healthy, my gosh, that's wonderful. You're creating art, you're de-stressing, and you're cooking. Okay, let me go ahead and show everyone what this looks like. So this looks really good so far, Chef. It smells really good. It smells incredible. You're absolutely right. Um, we are going to minimize salt in this dish, but I'm just going to add a pinch of salt at this stage to kind of really give it some nice flavor. And, um, and then we're going to add some tomato sauce into this. So, you know, you don't really have to um, get anything fancy. I'm just using a, a can of uh, tomato sauce, you know, the ones that are kind of processed really well and they don't have clumps of tomato because you really want this sauce to be velvety and smooth. And I'm going to add about a cup of it, like maybe I'll start with half and see. I'm sorry, I, 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 I've forgotten how to measure things. I don't do it anymore because we cooked this so many times that I've actually just memorized this. So we're going to add the tomato sauce in here and I've raised the temperature to high so that we could actually start you know, cooking it really well. We're going to mix, mix this a little bit and make sure that it doesn't burn. And quickly I'm going to add the spices. So I actually have some dried coriander, mm -hmm. which is, I just, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I did that last night fresh. So I also like, uh, you know, making sure that I process my... Um, Turmeric? Uh, yes, this is turmeric. I process the spices uh, as a whole, like I get them as a whole seed and then I, uh, you know, grill them or I uh, grind it. All right, now we're going to add about a teaspoon. Let me just go ahead and make this a teaspoon, a teaspoon of turmeric. Now turmeric gives this dish a beautiful golden color. And chef, did you know that turmeric is amazing for brain health? Yes. It actually is amazing. So, you know, one of the research that we did was 
to look at the effect of turmeric on brain health and we now know that when people eat turmeric on a regular basis, they actually have lower bad proteins in their brains, the kind of protein that is associated with Alzheimer's disease, which is incredible. Also, all the type of benefits, too. Absolutely. It's been around for thousands of years, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. So this is looking really good. We're definitely going to let it just cook a touch on heat, and then I'm going to add some water to it. So we added coriander, we added a little bit of turmeric. I'm actually going to add a touch of chili in there as well. Chef, are you okay with that? Oh yeah. All right, so Sounds we're good for me. All right, I perfect. Love spices. Yeah, so this is just some ground chili. I had like a little bit of Kashmiri chili, which is like the Indian hot chili sauce. But I thought that was like a little too much. This is a little mild. This is almost like Aleppo peppers. All right, so this smells is is it just out of this world right now. And um, to this, we're going to add about a cup of water. And I'm going to raise the heat. And the idea is to make a really nice braising sauce. Once it starts simmering like that, it's ready. And basically, our, our butternut squash is going to go in. To this, one more ingredient. At this stage, we're actually going to use add a little bit of sweetness to it as well. So we added a little bit of spice, turmeric, coriander, and now we're going to add about three tablespoons of brown sugar or the monk fruit sugar that we have. So the monk fruit sugar that we're using is a sugar substitute basically, and it's just going to really balance out the spices and the garlic and the ginger. Okay, so I'm just going to add three tablespoons of monk fruit sweetener. I have the golden version, but you could use just the regular yeah, white one white. as well. Did I have three? I didn't three. even yeah, count. Okay. <laughs> Problems of talking too much. Okay. All right. So this is really good. All right. Yeah, it looks really good and it smells incredible. Really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So we're just going to wait for our butternut squash to come out and then we're going to uh, mix it in here. Okay. So Chef Irvin and I have been chatting and our sauce is beautiful and it has reduced. Mm -hmm. The color looks much better. Amazing. Okay. And I think our butternut squash is ready, so we're gonna get that out. Oh, look at this. Okay. Look at this, Chef. Oh, looks great. Looks good, right? It actually looks like it's been fried or something like that. and that's a wonderful thing about cooking on high temperature in an oven it's healthier you use less oil mm -hmm. and it looks beautiful all right chef it's time for us to transfer this into the uh, the sauce amazing so it has nice and browned on both sides we actually flipped it a, a little bit in between um, we forgot to tell you guys about it, but we flipped it and it looks beautiful. And now we started the heat under the sauce. Let me kind of just go and uh, show you guys what it looks like. Um, and we're going to braise these baked and roasted butternut squash in the sauce. If the sauce looks a little dry, Chef, we could probably just add a little bit of water, water. in there. I'm going to go get the nice hot water. And when you're adding water to sauces, it's always good for it to be kind of warm and hot because you don't want it to stop the cooking Correct. process. So we have this amazing butternut squash that is just packed with fiber and vitamins. And we have our spices, which include turmeric, coriander. We have our alum, which is the onion, the ginger, the garlic. We added a little bit of monk fruit sweetener, uh, an artificial sweetener without the, you know, the harms of regular sugar. And it looks beautiful. And I'm pretty sure that every morsel is going to benefit our brain health. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, chef, I'm going to... Oh, it is hot, yeah. Safety first. So as you can see, the water, the sauce is getting a little dry. So we're going to add about half a cup of water. It's about half a cup. And we're going to kind of let it braise so that all of the butternut squash pieces are kind of covered in that beautiful yummy sauce. 
like that and maybe even in the middle we could probably just like you know twist it around a little mm -hmm. bit we don't have to like fight it too much and now it's on medium high heat and we're just going to cover it and we're going to let this cook in that beautiful sauce for about 15 minutes once it starts you know cooking and absorbing some of that delicious flavor it's ready to serve and so now you and I are going to make the lovely yogurt sauce that goes on top and at the bottom. Here we have some yogurt. So chef, I, I make my own yogurt from soy milk and almond milk at home. This one is uh, almond yogurt. And we can actually just go ahead and do a close up shot on this one. And the reason I use almond yogurt and soy yogurt is because we just want to reduce the amount of saturated fats that are found. But you know, people can use low fat yogurt too. As you can tell, the yogurt is really nice and creamy. Yes, it is. And chef, you were kind to uh, mince some ginger. Oh, I'm sorry, mince some garlic, garlic in there as well. So chef, if you could kindly just add the garlic into the yogurt sauce. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to add a touch of salt in there and mix it together. And that's basically it. So you kind of put a little bit of garlic in the yogurt to kind of jazz it up a little bit and it'll go really nicely at the bottom of the dish and on top of the butternut squash. This is a really simple right. dish, isn't it, it Chef Erwin? Really simple, easy, and quick. Yeah, it's quick and I promise you guys it's going to be delicious. delicious. All right, so we're going to wait for the butternut squash to braise for about 15 minutes mm -hmm. or so and meanwhile we're just going to get our plate ready. Okay, so let's go ahead. Okay, um, Chef Erwin, um, now we actually have a beautiful serving dish and you can use a really nice dish. I always like a white dish for, for this recipe because it has such rich colors mm -hmm. that it's going to really get highlighted on a white dish. So if you could kindly just put a layer of the yogurt sauce in there, perfect. And we're just going to just like spread it so that every spoonful of the butternut squash that you get has a little bit of flavor into it as well. Perfect. Don't be shy, Chef Erwin. Go for it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, Chef, let's take a look at our braised butternut squash. Ooh. Mm, looks great. Look okay. Close up for everyone. Look how beautiful that looks. The sauce has reduced. The butternut squash probably just kind of sucked up all those amazing sauces. So, Chef, I'm just going to place it here mm -hmm. if you don't mind. You can put it down, Chef. I probably will make you tired. Okay. All right. Oh, by the way, we have to turn it off first. So I turned off the heat, and I'm now going to serve this beautiful banana squash on the dish. And it's okay for you to kind of grab a little bit of the sauce along with it. We're going to drizzle it on top, too. Yogurt? And the yogurt will definitely go on top, just to drizzle on top of... You know, just a little bit. We don't, we don't want to hide the butternut squash. We want everything to be visible. Perfect, Chef. That looks so good. I wish you guys could smell this amazingness. Um, you know, I wish, I wish there was technology so we can actually transfer smell to the viewers too. <laughs> that looks beautiful. Okay. And this can be served... And any occasion, my mom serves this for Thanksgiving. It happens to be like the everybody's favorite Thanksgiving butternut squash dish um, because it's sweet and spicy, and of course, butternut squash. The so chef, this looks really, really beautiful. Now we're going to add a touch of other garnishes. So here I have some dried mint, but you could actually use some fresh mint too. This smells really good, doesn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to add a little bit of dried mint. mint. And dried mint actually kind of becomes a little more alive when you kind of, you know, like squish it between your fingers. Your fingers also start smelling really good. But don't be shy and just go ahead and, you know, really try to cover the butternut squash with the mint. And then for... This is ready, but I always like to add a little bit of pomegranate. And chef, pomegranates are so delicious. Delicious. And it really kind of celebrates the beginning of, you know, fall and winter season. 
and it looks like little jewels on top of the butternut squash here. Look at the color. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? And we have some pine nuts that we actually can add, but you can use pumpkin seeds, you can use hazelnuts, just a little bit of crunch to kind of give a different texture. The butternut is soft and smooth and spicy, and the pine nuts and the pomegranate just give it this beautiful, beautiful texture. How about cashew? Can we use cashew? Totally, cashews? absolutely. This is one of my favorites. Oh, mine too. I love cashews so much. What do you think, chef? Oh, it looks amazing. I, I, I want to taste it right now. I know. Let's go ahead and do that. We don't have to wait for anyone. <laughs> so you can actually serve this um, as is, as a side dish, or you could add it with a little bit of flatbread. So Chef Roman and I just had, you know, we had this beautiful lavash with some sesame seeds on it. Um, it's uh, mixed with whole wheat, so it's, it's healthy and it has a lot of fiber in it. But I think we could just eat it as is with even some brown rice or as a side for a main dish. All right, Chef, are you ready? Ready. Okay, let's dig in. I'm just gonna start right here. It's really hot, so. Mmm. Mmm, amazing. Really good. We got Chef Irwin's thumbs up. And what do you think? So, so I basically love the idea of the sweetness and the spiciness and the turmeric mixed together. And then when you're taking a bite, a little bit of a sour touch of pomegranate mm -hmm. just takes it to the next yeah. level. For I me. was about to say that it has a little kick at the end, spicy kick, which is perfect for me. Right? I love spicy. Yeah, I love it too. So this is it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the cooking uh, session with us. We made this beautiful butternut squash with uh, garlic yogurt sauce and mint. Um, you'll have access to the recipe. It was such a pleasure cooking with you, Chef Irwin. Uh, the pressure was mine. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, we should definitely do this again. That here's an example of a wonderful plant-centered dish that is incredibly delicious. And you saw it wasn't really that difficult. I think no, Chef Irwin and I just chatted a whole lot more than we were <laughs> cooking. But it's quick, easy, delicious, and you can make it anytime. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to try that dish and the dish was just fabulous. Um, so to say hello to both of you again, that dish was fabulous. Um, it was uh, it was a real treat. And as you say, it was perfect for this time of season. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. It's our pleasure. It was so much fun cooking with Chef Erwin. Uh, it was the kitchen smells amazing. <laughs> it, it sure did. Um, now our next chef that we're going to introduce is Chef Dusko um, Novakovic, who is uh, going to prepare your very nice cream cake. And that is in your cookbook, correct? That's correct. As a matter of fact, it's uh, it's on the cover of the book. It's, it that's was... what I thought. Yes, because we <laughs> had that and that's uh, an amazing dish. So <clears throat> just, as a, just as a story, a side story to the cover, we had difficult time actually accepting that when the publishers came to us and said, we're going to put a, what do you think if we put a cake cut on the cover? We said, wait a second, this is a science book, <laughs> a cookbook. Uh, they said, and, and they convinced us that people have to know that tasty, healthy food can be tasty. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole idea behind this. Sure, and it's also beautiful. It has that wonderful visual flair of the flowers and the berries, and and uh, and who doesn't want dessert? Come on, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's you can, true. You can have dessert multiple times a day. Right. Uh, when it's healthy like this, you, you can definitely have that. So I'm um, without further ado, we are going to go to the video with uh, <laughs> Chef Disco from um, the Kensington at Sierra Madre, and Chef is going to show us how to make this wonderful dish. Hi, my name is Dusko Novakovic, I'm Culinary Service Director in Kensington, Sierra Madre. I'm originally from Eastern Europe, and that's where I started my culinary adventure. My first spot and my first job, it is actually baking, so I'm super excited to do this with you today. Working here in Kensington and working with uh, people who live with Alzheimer, I do understand the importance of the healthy food. Today we will make super healthy and super easy dessert who do not require baking or cooking. 
you just need the blender and the freezer. For this cake, it's in two parts, and for, for first bottom part, you need two cups of the uh, raw cashews. The best way is like to soak them in the water at least for four hours, or just leave them over the night. You need one quarter cup of the soya unsweetened milk. You need one uh, half a cup of the uh, dates. That's around 10 dates. And the two ripe bananas uh, cut on the one inch and uh, uh, leave in the freezer at least for two hours. Okay, let's start. We will put first our cashews. Frozen banana, dates, and one quarter of cup of milk. We will blend that. Few, few times to be even 
and put in the freezer. I did pre-made earlier this cake, so this is how it should come out. Enjoy! Welcome back again, folks. Uh, that is an amazing dessert, Chef Dusko. Thank you so much for showing us how easy that is to make, and you you know you can you can create that in a, in a little bit of time. And in the evening, you have a wondrous dessert to to serve your guests. So, Chef Dusko, thank you so much for sharing that with us from Sarah Madre, um, folks. I know we're we're you know, close to running out of time, but I know there are questions that we may have as well. And questions have been coming to me um, from um, members who have been watching. So I wanna share some of that with you. Um, one of the questions is about sweet potatoes. Why should we be eating sweet potatoes? Uh, sweet potatoes are known, you know, within a lot of different cultures, Japanese, it's an important part of their diet as well. Um, but why is it that sweet potatoes are, are um, we should be considering them? Well, um, sweet potatoes, well, first of all, we should ask ourselves, why aren't we eating enough sweet potatoes? Um, it's such an amazing root vegetable. Um, you know, it's available, it's cheap, you can find it all year round. Um, and when you look at the content, you know, it's just packed with fiber. One of the things that keeps coming back over and over again in multiple research uh, studies, as far as nutrition goes, is the lack of fiber in our diet. And the lack of fiber, fiber causes so many GI issues like constipation, like bloating, like not uh, being able to actually absorb important minerals and vitamins because of the lack of fiber in our foods. And so adding more fiber should be the main goal, whatever dietary pattern people follow. And sweet potato is an excellent way to do so. But along with that, you get great carbohydrates, good carbohydrates. And yes, there are good carbohydrates and bad carbohydrates. Uh, you get vitamins, specifically vitamin A, carotenoids, which are so important for eye health and brain health, and for essentially getting rid of all the inflammation and oxidation that this magnificent brain of ours makes. So remember, the brain is the one of the most energy hungry organs in our body, you know, we think we do different things. And so, you know, obviously, it actually creates a lot of byproducts. So the kind of foods that we eat or the kind of internal environment that we create should be one that could get rid of that inflammation and oxidation as soon as possible. And the nutrients that are found in sweet potato do just that. Man, I made sweet potato sound amazing, didn't I? Just it's, now? Uh, but, uh, I'm ready to buy stock. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it is an excellent. I'm going to short all regular potatoes and buy. And, and, and just like squash, I think it's such an amazing, versatile, um, you know, root vegetables. You can bake it, you can boil it, you can mash it. We actually make some sweet mashed potatoes, you know, oh. along with some sage and rosemary for Thanksgiving. It's just beautiful. I mean, I shouldn't be adding because you said everything beautifully. <laughs> but, uh, and, but the way we work is we make sure that we don't one up the other person. And there's no way I can one up this. <laughs> But <clears throat> the, the, the concept of eating is the food in front of you. Mm. What bad things does it have or doesn't have? Yeah. And what good things does it have and doesn't have? Right. It doesn't have processed material in it. It doesn't have simple sugars. It doesn't have saturated fat. It has fiber by the tons. Well, if you get a ton of sweet potatoes. Yeah. And it has nutrients, vitamins, minerals, uh, the good sugar, which is the complex sugar. Yes. I mean, does it get any better? I love it. I love it. And it seems like they haven't been GMO'd. So that's the problem with regular potatoes. We don't really know where they come from. Yeah. So and you know there there's all sorts of studies that are showing that when that happens to potatoes, when you you know farm potatoes in a certain way because you need to have the perfect French fry that has to be you know five inches or six inches long because you won't eat them then that's that's injurious to our good health. Yeah. So yeah. I don't I mean, think they've done that to sweet potatoes yet, have they? Yeah. No, I mean, and regular potatoes, we do know where it comes from. We know it's it's parent. It's one parent. That's the whole point of GMOs. <clears throat> it's got one parent and 50 million progeny. That's where the problem lies. But with the sweet potatoes, it's got so much variety, beauty, and, and complexity. Uh, you also mentioned fiber. So how much fiber should we be getting um, in our diets every day. 
Well, typically, what, and, and you know, this, this is really cool. When they did studies, um, paleontologists, when they analyzed, you know, uh, historical poop from human beings, they realized that back then human beings actually ate a ton of fiber, almost 70 grams, seven zero grams of fiber per day. They were basically just literally eating plants, you know, and very little meat, if at all. And so, you know, our body functions best when we eat at least between 40 to 50 grams of fiber every day now in a typical western diet in an american diet it's almost impossible to get that um, and they've done studies that looked at the amount of you know the average amount of fiber that people eat and we americans we eat about 15 grams of pro, uh, fiber and that's like the ones that actually try to add more fiber to their diets let alone people who just you know, live from drive through to drive through uh, because they're too busy to cook at home. But when you cook at home and when you cook things like the butternut squash or, for example, you choose, you know, one different vegetables every day, maybe a Japanese sweet potato or, you know, the, the yams that we find everywhere. If you do that, I think you can increase your fiber intake very easily. So once again, it's about being, being cognizant of what you're eating. And Absolutely. And if the more cognizant we are, the more mindful we are about the foods that we choose, then we can make better choices. And the choices you mentioned is all around us. And we can prepare it in so many different ways. I know we use it here as a substitute for mashed potatoes. We use, we, we use it um, here at the Kensington, also mashed cauliflower. So, so, you know, it really changes the glycemic index and is much healthier, less carbs. We don't need those starches. Our elders really don't need those no. additional, you know, carbs and starches. Or maybe they're not, a, they're a little more sedentary than um, the rest of us are, of course, if they're retired and they're, you know, wanting to, um, you know, have a, a nice, comfortable lifestyle. But we, we are cognizant of that as well in terms of how we serve up our meals. Another question came up is, um, what type of diet do you recommend or eating program to help prevent slow cognitive decline? I know you you have something called the Neuro9, which is something that is, is that part of this program? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when everything we say and everything we do is based on science and the latest evidence, you know, from multiple amazing research. And when it comes to nutrition and diet, um, several studies have shown that it's not about one food or one superfood at a time, that it's about the dietary pattern, because we don't eat one thing at a time. It's the collective nature of what's on our plate that matters the most, and it's the synergy between these food products that matter the most. Um, so that's why they've come up with different dietary patterns, like the Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet. But, you know, that said, at you know, we don't we don't believe in superfoods, but there are certain foods that stand out. And when they've done factor analysis, which means, you know, a statistical analysis to see which foods actually determine the best brain health, these foods, these nine foods, we highlighted them in our book. And we 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 urge people to at least try to include these nine foods in their daily meals, because when you eat of something, you try to stay away from other things that could potentially be harmful. And I'm actually just getting my memory let's, tested let's here memory. to see if I can remember the neuron. <clears throat> but, you know, on top of uh, the whole food category stands um, or the, the greens or the bottom of the pyramid is. Oh, the bottom. Oh, okay. Greens. 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 So greens are important. It's, you know, one of the most um, healthful thing ever. It is packed with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory. Then we have whole grains. You know, people are scared of grains, but if they're whole grains and if you know where they come from, things like oatmeal or quinoa or, you know, uh, uh, whole grains, like whole wheat bread, you know, maybe but definitely sourdough because it increases the good bacteria and it, those are amazing things to include in our diet and it has has a lot of fiber in it as well <clears throat> then comes the cruciferous vegetables which are broccoli and cauliflower and kale and brussels sprouts you know all those amazing things we're going to be having this november for thanksgiving then we have beans you know beans and legumes and <clears throat> good clean proteins all right, I'm going to run through this. Then we have berries. You know, when, when it comes to fruits, berries stand tall because they've done multiple studies that show that people <coughs> who consume berries on a regular basis have lower risk.
risk of cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> then we have spices like turmeric that we use today for the cooking session or right. dried coriander, mint, sage, thyme, so many other ones as well. Green tea is next. <clears throat> it has specific types of antioxidants that uh, actually fight oxidation and inflammation in our body. I lost count. What did I say? Seeds. So yes, <laughs> nuts and seeds. So nuts. Things like walnuts, you know, hazelnuts and seeds <clears throat> such as flax seeds and chia seeds, they have omega-3 fatty acids that are the only type of fat that our brain requires on a daily basis because it keeps the infrastructure healthy and it removes all the inflammatory byproducts. So those are the neuronine. I, I hope believe I covered so. everything. <laughs> yeah, I think we got all, all of the we the, the other question that came up is the power of, of soups. Now, our culture really doesn't, or American culture doesn't really include soup as, as much as maybe it, as it should. I know certain Asian cultures, Korean culture, Japanese culture, the whole Danabi approach to, to cooking. It's about having a pot, a Danabi pot, and it, there's a broth. And that broth is the hearth of the home. It's hearth of the room. You dine together. As a family, you share that meal. <clears throat> well, it's really an intrinsic difference. But um, I also grew up around soup, soups. My mother was a great cook. Um, and so we had soup every single day. So what type of soups do you recommend? I know there are soups in your cookbook, but uh, what type of soups do you recommend for that are overall for good health? Oh, goodness. We, we, uh, we eat a lot of soup, <clears throat> and I completely agree with you. Um, I think soups are a great vehicle of introducing vegetables in our meals. Yeah. And um, the good thing is, you know, growing up as a mother of two teenagers, we even fooled our kids by adding, you know, blending vegetables to become a part of the broth itself. <laughs> so it, it can be amazing. And my gosh, I mean, the choices are limitless. Uh, exactly. I mean, it's not just a matter of quality but quantity as well mm -hmm. i mean our kids ha are very you know healthy and and they eat lots of vegetables and fruits and all of that but uh, sometimes it becomes you know if you want to give them more greens and more vegetables soup is an amazing vehicle mm -hmm. vector through which introduce all of this um and and the blending of the tastes is as a way that you can actually introduce new tastes I think one of the best ways of introducing new things in general, as far as food is concerned, is through the vehicle of soup, because you can, because you can adjust so easily. The malleable nature of its liquid structure, a lot, no, that's, that sounded too chemi chemistry, <laughs> my chemistry class is coming, but it, it allows you kind of adapt it to the tastes of the people in front of you, yeah. uh, whether it's your kids or whatever, but you can introduce anything through soup by just adjusting the different quantities. And that's why it makes it so much more malleable. Um, one of our members at the Brain Health Revolution community had a you know point and said, you know, it's really difficult to eat salads in the winter. It's cold and you just really aren't drawn to eating cold foods and you're craving some warmth and you crave some spices. So how would you make sure that you're eating enough greens uh, in the winter? And one of the quick answers was, add your greens to your soup. So say, for example, you have a beautiful, you know, cream of tomato soup, you have some roasted tomatoes, and you've creamed it with some cashew cream, it's really nice and rich. And instead of just eating it that way, make sure you add a fist of spinach in it, or make sure that you cut down some, you know, Swiss charts and just add it at the very end, because you don't want it to disappear, you just want it to become soft with the heat of the soup in it. And, you know, the same goes for, say, lentil and squash soup or like a really warm, nice ginger soup with sweet potatoes and carrots and maybe even not, you know, playing around with cutting the vegetables. Like, for example, there's a lot of times where I make a really nice miso broth, but instead of adding noodles, what I do is I make noodles out of sweet potatoes. And at the very end, I add the sweet potato noodles there and it becomes so delicious. Amazing. Um, along with the broth. I could go on and on, as you can see, Robert. I mean, I'll right. Well, no, the, the one secret that you were shared with us today, of course, is baking um, squash, but you can bake all your vegetables. You can bake them. They get this wonderful umami, this extra taste of, of, of baking them. And then you take those, those, those various vegetables and then you blend them together, add a nice little broth or miso broth, and you have got this incredible, you know, um, 
puree of vegetables. Again, you're eating a lot of vegetables. Yes. Yeah, one one myth. Of vegetables. It changes the texture, changes Absolutely. the context of how you you serve this, and to 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 to, to your audience or to your guests. Absolutely. Uh, one myth out there is that um, food has to be raw in order to be healthy. It's at, the, at its pure. It's it's not. Many many of the fruit uh, vegetables actually um, are healthier when they're processed and and uh, either cut, blended or cooked. Mm -hmm. More of its nutrients come to the surface. You have, that's that level of specificity. We don't need to get here, but but it really helps with that when you cook a lot of the foods, a lot of the nutrients come to this, you know, uh, become available. That's that's why soups and, and, and broiling and, and, and baking actually can be incredibly beneficial. All right. Um, folks, I want to thank the both of you for taking time out of your busy schedule in your lives, but to share the passion and the importance of cooking and sharing your recipes with all of us. I would also like to thank Chef um, Irwin and Chef Disco for all their hard work that they've done uh, and, and uh, sharing their uh, dining experience. Uh, Chef Irwin's behind me here saying hello, Chef, thank you. But to, but, but to you all, all, thank you for your passion and commitment to aging well and the brain health revolution. Thank you We're so, so much. glad to be here. Thank you so much for having us. It was wonderful to share all of this with you all. And thank you, Chef Erwin, for coming by and cooking. Ho hopefully we can cook again. You're yeah. all invited to our home. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Everyone, the whole crowd. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Talk to you soon. Cheers. <clears throat> Bye, guys. Take care.